Tonight, the light at the end of the tunnel brightens as the daily number of Omicron cases begins to wane and we slowly move away from crisis mode closer to life without daily COVID disruptions. But parts of the country are still dealing with overcrowded hospitals and all bets are off if a new variant emerges. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Joining us tonight, as always, is our friend, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And joining us later on tonight, our special guest is Dr. Stephen Wangle, Professor of Psychology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And you at home are a big part of our show. In just a little bit, we're going to open up our phone lines and take your questions. But first, Dr. Gold, how widespread is the virus around the world tonight? Well, Christina, first of all, from a recovering cardiac surgeon, I want to wish everybody a very, very happy uh, Valentine's Day. And, you know, please take a minute uh, to extend your very best wishes to those that you love, your family and your friends. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't spend enough time doing that, and today is a day to be reminded. But with that, let's get into the numbers, and the numbers, fortunately, are good and continue to improve. Uh, Let's start off with the worldwide data. Uh, just under 394 million confirmed cases, 2.8 million in the last 24 hours, uh, and just over 5.7 million deaths, hard to believe. Death rate continues to rise up about 32% in the last 14 days, but the case numbers are falling, and hopefully the hospitalizations and the deaths uh, will continue to fall uh, over time. When we look at the map of the world, we can see that still uh, all of Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, uh, all of Australia, large parts of South America, almost all of North America are still deeply colored in purple and dark red, uh, indicating very high transmission rates. And almost all of the world is seeing the impact of the Omicron variant that we've discussed so many times on this show. When we switch now and look at the United States, we can see that cases are well down. Uh, we've had over 76 million uh, confirmed cases in the United States, just under 300,000 in the last 24 hours. But that's 57 percent down uh, over the last 14 days. Hospitalization, 121,000, uh, down 23 percent over the last uh, 14 days. But our death rate is still high. It's the most lagging indicator. We've unfortunately broken through the 900,000 death rate uh, and over 2.5 thousand uh, in the last 24 hours, up 18 uh, percent in the last 14 days. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Uh, the map continues to look better and better across the United States. You may remember several weeks ago, it was colored deeply purple, almost from coast to coast and border to border. And now we're seeing areas of amber, light yellow, uh, even the grays and whites, uh, indicating that the case rate per 24 hours uh, per 100,000 population continues to fall. Nowhere near where we want it to be. But when you look at this uh, curve, uh, you can see that we are now almost at the level of the peak of the Delta variant. And so while we're very pleased that we've come well down from the peak of the Omicron variant at just over 800,000 uh, cases per day, we still have a long way to go to get to anywhere near the baseline that we had in late June and early July, let alone down to uh, putting uh, Omicron behind us. When we look at the cases by state, you see the U.S. is at about 53 per 100,000 per day. But Alaska, Mississippi, West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, Idaho, and others are still well over more than twice uh, the U.S. Uh, average of cases, making the point that there's still quite a bit of variability. And when we look at smaller geographic distributions, such as Nome uh, in Alaska, uh, Scott County in Tennessee, uh, Estill uh, County in Kentucky. You can see with a U.S. average of 53 per 100,000 per day, Noma's at 684, you know, more than 10 times higher 
and all of these other smaller counties, making the point that our rural counties are still very, very uh, significant in terms of the transmission rates of uh, COVID-19. If we look at this chart, it reminds us again that we're dealing predominantly with the Omicron variant, which is much more transmissible, but somewhat less severe uh, than the Delta variant and less severe and certainly much less transmissible than the original variant of the virus that we had now more than two years ago, hard to believe but that the latest uh, subtype of Omicron, known as BA2, which we'll look at in a little more detail in a minute, appears to be about the same severity, appears to have about the same impact of the vaccines in preventing serious infection, but is about 50% more transmissible than even the Omicron variant appeared to be. And we're now seeing spread of the BA2 variant pretty widely across the United States and, uh, and actually in other parts of the world. If we look at hospitalizations, you can see that they continue to fall in the United States. The upper line is total hospitalization. The lower line is intensive care unit hospitalization. Both are coming down, but as you see, we still have a long way to go to get down to any kind of baseline anywhere near as low as we were uh, uh, six months ago. If we look at where those hospitalizations have occurred, it's no secret as we've seen the very high case rates uh, start to fall uh, from the uh, northeast and the mid-Atlantic region and spread into the southeast and the south central, the greater Texas, Oklahoma, uh, and the southwestern part of the United States. Hospitalization is about two weeks later than the case rate, and tragically the death rates seem to lag by yet another two to three weeks uh, after that. Uh, if we look at the rate of hospitalization, you see the U.S. average has come down to approximately 28 per 100,000 in the last 24 hours. But West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, Alabama, Arkansas, Washington, D.C. are still one and a half to two and a half times uh, the uh, U.S. average. So we're still seeing a good deal of hospitalization. And even in our community here, we've seen the total number of hospitalization uh, in the state of Nebraska go down, but it's still nowhere near the baseline and it's still stressing our health care systems as it is in many other parts of the country. Uh, this chart reminds us that in purple, you're seeing the Omicron BA1 subtype, but we're starting to see just a tiny sliver of uh, pink above the purple, and that is the beginning of the spread of the BA2 subtype. Because if we look at this next graphic, uh, what it shows us is that depending on what part of the country we're looking at, there are slivers of BA2 uh, that are present across the country. Now, as I said earlier, it does not appear to be more severe, but it's about 50% uh, more transmissible. And so we're going to have to keep an eye on this, again, underscoring the need for inappropriate settings, the use of masks, and of course, vaccine and boosters. When we shift gears to look at death rates across the country, we are still at a higher death rate than we were at the Delta peak that occurred in late September, early October. Uh, but we're starting to see the inflection point, at least in certain parts of the country along the coasts, less so uh, in the central uh, rural farming and ranching communities that, of course, we're so interested in making sure we keep an eye on. So U.S. average, uh, 0.74 per 100,000, but Mississippi, Virginia, approximately twice the U.S. average in death rates. And even West Virginia, Kansas, and Arkansas are still one and a half times approximately uh, the total uh, U.S. death rate. I'd like to share these graphics with the audience uh, tonight just to make the point about the impact of these death rates as it compares to other parts of the world. So going back to the very beginning of the pandemic in January of 2020 through the end of January in 2022, so that's approximately... Uh, two years, we see where the United States death rates are uh, per 100,000 population. So this is all normalized per 100,000 population. And as you see, we were running somewhere in the midst of Belgium, Britain, uh, France, and Sweden, and somewhat higher than Germany, Netherlands, and Canada, and much, much higher than Japan and Australia. 
But if we go to the next graphic, you can see what's happened since the very beginning of the Omicron variant spread, December of 2021 through January 31st. So two full months, all of December, all of January. And what you can see here is that the United States has significantly more deaths per 100,000. So the Germany is peaking at about 18 to 19 uh, per 100,000. We're at about 32, 31 to 32. Uh, per 100,000 population uh, per week, this is, by the way. And the explanation for that is actually found in some of our vaccine curves. So this looks at the in the United States compared to all of the other countries uh, from the first access to the vaccines. You may remember it was almost a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, that the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines became available. And as you see, for a very long time, for the first, oh, I would say six to seven months, the vaccination rate in the United States far exceeded Western Europe, Australia, Japan, and Canada. But over the last six to 12 months, that curve started to flatten and other parts of the world, particularly the higher income countries of the world, started to take the lead. And if we look at boosting, it's even a more profound story than that. And what you can see is that Belgium, Britain, Germany, the Netherlands, France, uh, Canada, Sweden, and Australia have all exceeded us since the boosters became widely available in the beginning of August of this year. And that clearly tells the story of why we are seeing more Omicron mortality uh, than the other parts of the world. So why don't we stop at this point uh, and we can come back to these graphics a little bit later when we get some questions about long COVID. Absolutely. Well, we have so many questions tonight. We're in this really bizarre kind of gray area right now. We've heard from a number of states that they're considering and some have even made the call to go ahead and ease up on mask restrictions. But we've been burned before, Dr. Gold, and we don't want to get our hopes up right now. Could this actually be it? Could we actually finally be on the good side of this pandemic? You know, Christina, I certainly hope we are. And we certainly could be. But as I like to say, hope is not a plan. And so we make decisions around what I like to refer to as an abundance of caution. And so we are still leaning very hard on not just vaccination, but boosting across all ages that are eligible. And I'm sure we'll unpack that in a few minutes. And we're also still uh, using masks here uh, at the medical center and in large uh, social gatherings across the community. We will know within another month, I would guess, as to whether or not there's going to be another very significant variant that will get us to uh, rethink some of our precautions. But right now, uh, we are trying very, very hard to maintain the best non-pharmacologic interventions that we can and continue to strongly recommend for all eligible age groups vaccination and when uh, appropriate uh, boosting because we know that that will continue to protect our population slow spread keep our kids in school keep our churches and synagogues open keep our hospitals you know accessible to all those who need them open physician offices take care of the crowding that's occurring in pharmacies and other areas. So for all of those reasons, and mostly uh, to get our lives back with all the frustration and the, and the wear and tear that we've had, uh, we'd like to make sure that this is behind us and that we're not opening the door to another big wave of transmission. Mm, but we should have more information on that within another month. That is really helpful. That alone, I think all of us can hold on for another 30 days, especially because now we have this optimism <laughs> kind of moving us forward, the wind beneath our wings right now. So many of us are looking forward to life beyond the pandemic. But one of the big game changers has been the booster shot we know that it can offer significant protection against the virus. Many people were hesitant about getting the vaccine because of the mRNA component, but um, what's the holdup with the booster? Because they already got the two doses of the mRNA in many cases. Why won't they get the booster? 
So, you know, we're about 28 percent, 27 percent, 28 percent boosted of those that are eligible. Again, much lower than the other parts of the world when the boosters were uh, rolled out of the Western uh, countries. You know, I'm not sure what the hesitancy is. I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, I think there are some people that uh, recall that uh, both Pfizer and Moderna are working on a new type of booster that is Omicron specific. So some of our audience and others may be holding on for that. Others may know individuals uh, who are fully vaxxed, maybe not boosted, who became infected, uh, you know, a so-called breakthrough infection, and they be, may be wondering how effective the boosters really are in preventing infection and preventing hospitalization. Now, we know with a very high degree of certainty that the boosters reduce the rates of hospitalization by over 90 percent from the Omicron variant. And so you look at who's in the hospital these days. These are either people that are either not immunized or not boosted or people that have known immunocompromised situations, solid organ transplants, cancer patients, people on high-dose steroids for other medical issues. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, there's still always a fraction of individuals uh, who are vaccine hesitant. They've been vaccine hesitant all along. But we still have a good ways to go uh, to catch up with. You know, if you think about it, we're about, as a nation, uh, we're in the mid-60 percent vaccinated of all of those uh, that are eligible. Fortunately, we're much, much higher than that in individuals over 65. And so, uh, you know, we've got about to double the rate of uh, boosting. Uh, and hopefully that will happen over the uh, ensuing months. Certainly, you know, I, I look at our population here in the Med Center, and that would be the doctors, pharmacists, therapists, technicians, dietitians, and, you know, so many others. We're the, actually the largest employer uh, in the state. And we're at about 85 percent boosted of those that are eligible. And so I think that's a good sign that people who are, you know, influencers, people that really understand the literature, and can make a decision, have decided that they not only wanted to get vaxxed, but they wanted to get boosted as well. Mm. You know, this is also an interesting time because we're dealing with a lot of aftermath now. The pandemic has been going on for years at this point. In order for some people to avoid getting the virus, many have avoided critical health appointments during the pandemic, including cancer screenings, even routine checkups. They want to stay away from medical facilities. What is your message to those who may still be holding off on returning to the doctor's office? Well, everybody's medical situation is different depending on what their risks are, how old they are, and what types of testing or screening they're missing. But I'll tell you, we are seeing a very large number of patients that have skipped their usual mammogram or pap test, they didn't get a follow-up CT scan, or they didn't get their children immunized for one reason or another uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and indeed, many times, not their fault. I mean, the waiting lists are long, access has been difficult. Indeed, they may have even been advised to wait till the pandemic transmission rates fell in their community to more acceptable levels. But what we're seeing, Christina, is people with later stage cancer. That makes it much harder to treat. Uh, we're seeing children uh, come in with infections that could have been prevented uh, with vaccination. And indeed, as our audience may know, our children's hospitals are packed with children with respiratory infections, including COVID and flu and RSV and, and other related respiratory infections, many of whom you know, are as young as six months that are now on ventilators, and unfortunately, a small but definite number have actually lost their battle uh, with COVID. And uh, I think the number I saw through the end of December was about 650 children had lost their lives that we knew of for sure, but 265,000 were hospitalized uh, up to that point. So what's my message? Uh, my message is uh, that please get your routine health care. Get your vaccinations up to date, your shingle shots, your pneumovac shots, and other such things. Uh, please, you know, when it's time for your cancer screening or your follow-up visit, please don't delay that because all it's doing 
is converting what could be a routine type of health care event into an emergency that drives you into the emergency department that then requires urgent care, which never has quite the same good outcome as a routine scheduled visit. So uh, that's what I've recommended, uh, certainly what I recommend to my family. And if our members of our audience are concerned, uh, you know, have a chat with your health care professional. Ask them, is this the time to get your follow-up screening, uh, your follow-up test, your, your vaccines? And if so, how and when to do it? It has become much safer. You know, many of us know somebody who has had COVID and who has probably relayed to you that they just don't feel like they'll ever be the same again. How do you know if you have long COVID and what are you learning about its prevalence? Well, first of all, we are learning that long COVID is extremely common. As a matter of fact, in a recent study done uh, and published in the British Medical Journal, looked at over 130,000 individuals uh, that were diagnosed with COVID, most of which actually were not hospitalized, that about 35% of them, a full third, had COVID long symptoms. That means that in the definition of their study, more than three weeks after they were no longer symptomatic with COVID, long after they were back to work, back to school, whatever they were doing in their routine life, between that point three weeks later and during the following six months, a full third of them had symptoms. Now, most of those symptoms were shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, fatigue, but if we go down the list, and we actually have a graphic, perhaps we can pull that next graphic in the set just to share with our audience because this comes directly from this publication uh, in the British Medical Journal. As you can see that in descending order, respiratory failure, which means shortness of breath and exercise intolerance, high blood pressure, memory losses, kidney injuries, mental health abnormalities, which mostly means stress, uh, clotting abnormalities of your blood, which means vein thrombosis, uh, irregularities of your heartbeat, uh, dementia, uh, which is a type of, of confusion, type 2, new type 2 diabetes, congestive heart failure, uh, anemia, which is due to low blood count, stroke, uh, blockages of the coronary arteries causing a heart attack, abnormalities of your liver, sleep apnea, elevations of pulmonary blood pressure, skin rashes, et cetera, that we've talked about in our show last week, all of these are elevated uh, with 95% confidence limits. And it just makes the point that those that are uh, infected with COVID, even if they're mild, minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic cases, and this cohort that I just described to you are over 65 years of age, the consequences are really significant. And I was just actually talking to one of the people that I work with today who is quite young, I would say in, our, in her late 30s, early 40s, uh, had COVID several weeks ago. And she was telling me that she still can't sleep well, she can't focus uh, on work and uh, has almost no exercise tolerance. You know, this is somebody that used to run half marathons, not infrequently, has got a really wonderful young family. And uh, unfortunately, you know, up one flight of stairs or two and she's short of breath. And, uh, you know, I'm hearing that more and more and more. So in answer to your question, Christina, I think people who have long COVID, they know it. The good news is that there are treatments for each of these sets of symptoms. The bad news is we don't know how long it's going to last for. So again, we need to do everything we can to keep uh, the COVID rates down, to keep people out of the hospitals. And that's particularly also true in our children. You know, we hear, uh, again, uh, it's not a full third of children uh, that get long COVID, but it's at least one out of 10, and it may be uh, two out of 10 kids uh, get some sequelae to uh, hospitalized or not hospitalized uh, COVID. So again, when those vaccines and boosters are available for the younger uh, children, uh, they need to roll up their sleeve as well. Absolutely, wow. 20% chance for our little, our little ones. We care so much about our children. You bring up such an important point, Dr. Gold. And you put it into perspective, which is why we love having you on this show. If you at home have a question, 
Why not give us a call tonight? Dr. Gold is here for you. We're going to pause for a quick break, but we still have time for your call. The number is 877-731-6733. We're here for you on a Valentine's Day. When we come back, Dr. Stephen Wangle, professor of psychology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, will join our conversation to talk about the impact the pandemic has had on our mental health. We'll be right back with more. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome our special guest, Dr. Stephen Wangle. Now, he is the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Campus Wellness for the University of Nebraska Medical Center, also a practicing geriatric psychiatrist. And he's here to talk about how we can manage our stress and tend to our mental health as the pandemic continues now into a third year. Dr. Wangle, talk about the difference between managing stress over the course of a short-term period versus the long-term that we've been dealing with, these ongoing stresses, the pressure that's collective but lasts for an extended period of time. Great question. Good evening. Um, I think that's really the key to this whole whole thing, right? We, <clears throat> that uh, the pandemic is like a marathon, but it's a marathon where we keep changing the finish line, right? Uh, as the two of you talked about earlier in the show. And I think that's really one of the hardest parts of this is the uncertainty, you know, when's it going to be over? You know, what does being over actually look like and so forth? And I think that's what contributes to a lot of the chronic stress that we're seeing, just uh, that, that kind of chronic uncertainty. And I think it's also the notion that uh, we've all been on kind of high alert. You know, our brains have been, uh, you know, under a lot of stress as we anticipate, you know, things or, or worry about things with the pandemic for a long time. We're... we're the body, the body is really pretty amazing, of course, right? It's an amazing structure, and we're built to be able to take stress, but we're not really designed to take chronic stress that's this long, two years and counting. We can do it. We're doing it. We're adapting, but it's not really, we're not really designed for this, and so when that happens, um, one of the things that we know is that cortisol levels are high. Cortisol is a stress hormone that our body makes. It's a really good thing to have, uh, and, but it's really intended for acute stress, like, uh, you know, God forbid you're in a car accident or something like that. You know, your body puts out cortisol to keep you alive. Um, but when you're under chronic stress, like the pandemic, our body has been cranking out cortisol at a higher than normal level for a long time. And that produces a lot of um, a lot of the symptoms that we're seeing, a lot of the stress symptoms, the insomnia and things like that. It's, it's such an interesting time because we don't know what the history books are going to say about this pandemic. If you talk to people who lived through the Great Depression, they'll say they didn't really even notice at the time as they were going through it just how hard it was. So I have to wonder, are some of us just continually coming to terms with the pandemic, going through the various stages of grief over and over again? Is that how we're processing all of this? I think that's a good way to look at it, right? Because I think we've all had to um, make so many big adjustments. Who hasn't given something up, a graduation that they couldn't attend or a funeral or some other event or a vacation or a family get-together they, they've had to put off? Not to mention actually losing loved ones, of course, sadly. So I think you're right. I think it has been kind of a, a roller coaster ride of, of grief symptoms, um, and I think it'll continue for a while, too. As you say, the history books are being written. This is, uh, in, a, in a sense, kind of a huge sociological and psychological as well as an immunological experiment. And I think the consequences of this will only be known down the road a piece. Yeah, it's really, really tough. You know, I find myself, I don't even go to the grocery store anymore. I'm ordering everything. It's very rare for me to actually leave my home, which means I'm cutting off communication with other humans. And I wonder how down the road all of this is going to play out. Now, we are going to go back to this conversation because I know a lot of people have a lot of questions about the pandemic and mental health. But we want to bring Cheryl in. Cheryl joins us from Florida. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead with your question tonight. I sure appreciate this opportunity. I hope you can understand me. I actually have COVID while I'm asking this question. I'd like to know if Dr. Gold knows when we might have Novavax in the United States. I understand it's gone in front of the FDA. 
Yep, that's a great question, Cheryl. And first of all, uh, I hope you recover quickly, and I really hope that you don't end up as one of the uh, long COVID uh, patients. Uh, you sound pretty good to me on the phone, and so uh, that makes me feel very optimistic. Uh, so the uh, Food and Drug Administration is obviously studying the submission uh, by Novavax. And Novavax uh, product, vaccine, uh, actually we know quite well here because we participated in uh, one of the clinical trials uh, for Novavax. And of course, we don't know uh, what the results of that trial showed, but we do know that the Novavax vaccine is a very different type of vaccine. It is not an mRNA vaccine, nor is it a virus vector vaccine. It is a pure protein vaccine that is made to duplicate some of the spike proteins of the COVID-19 causing virus, SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, we are optimistic that uh, that it'll go through the uh, Food and Drug Administration, you know, in a reasonably short period of time, uh, which, you know, could be uh, weeks, uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, rolled out. Now, whether it'll be rolled out as a primary sequence or whether it'll be rolled out as another type of booster or both uh, remains to be seen. But because it's a different type of vaccine, it is very attractive uh, to potentially be another arrow in the quiver uh, against COVID. Uh, I don't think the uh, FDA and the ACIP, the advisory committee, uh, feel the same pressure to move things through as they did uh, when they moved through the first three, because we have three very effective vaccines uh, that are on the market today. And we also have ongoing clinical trials for different types of boosters for both uh, Moderna and Pfizer. And so hopefully we'll see the Novavax product soon, but, uh, you know, it'll be it'll have its own niche and its own role. All right. And thank you for that call. We hope that you feel better. Get well soon, Cheryl. Doug from Pennsylvania joins the conversation now. Thanks for joining us, Doug. Go right ahead. Thank you both uh, or all. Uh, I'm, I'm a fellow who has taken a, uh, a long study of your program and appreciated it. I've certainly taken a lot of your advice. I don't go into restaurants currently. I order out, and uh, they seem to be happy to serve it to me, and I go. We skipped our Christmas get-together, and uh, I'm looking at uh, the possibility of the family coming up to see me. We're 100 miles from each other. They're down in Maryland. I'm here in Pennsylvania. The question is, listening to everything that I listened to tonight, and we all know, would I be more prudent to ask the family to wait until perhaps April and we see how things go throughout March? Or would you say, go ahead and uh, get together? We're all vaccinated. It would be a 50-year-old, a couple 70-year-olds, and 80-year-old people. That's all I have, and thank you for everything. Well, thanks for your question, Doug. Uh, I think that if you could put this off a month, with no impact, that is to say there's no special occasion, there's no reason you need to get together, i.e. it's not a family gathering around a wedding or other type of celebration, uh, graduation, uh, et cetera, then I would definitely do that. But even if you put it off a month, uh, even if all of the individuals are fully vaxxed, uh, I would recommend that they all get tested uh, within 24 hours of getting in the car uh, and heading up to visit with each other. You know, I, I just think it gives you that added degree of uh, confidence. Even though they're, uh, you know, middle age uh, and older, uh, and by the way, middle age is, is, is changing every day for all of us, right? That's the good news. Uh, is that, uh, you know, minimal infection, early infection has been seen quite significantly with the Omicron variant, particularly the BA2 subtype. And so for all of those reasons, and we know that the antigen tests, the point of care rapid tests are adequate for detecting the uh, BA1 and the BA2 Omicron subtypes, uh, we would recommend before you do it. I mean, before I would uh, visit with my family, uh, that's exactly what I do. Uh, I, the, either the night before or the morning of, depending on whether I'm flying or driving, uh, I'll get a quick test, uh, make sure it's negative, and then head on. It's not a 100% guarantee, but it really reduces the risk. 
All right. Thank you so much for that call. Let's bring Dr. Wangle back into the conversation. Some scientists and journalists have been using the term languishing quite a bit lately for what many people are going through. Describe what languishing is and what your prescription for languishing is as well. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Incidentally, I apologize for having to hold this microphone up. We've had some technical difficulties. I'm told I have a face made for radio anyway, so it's better that you hear me than see me. But uh, yeah, languishing is an interesting term. It came out, um, it's been around for a while. I mean, the, the, the word, of course, has been around forever. But used in this context, uh, there's a New York Times article last year where they talked about languishing is probably the prevalent, prevalent mood of the country. And this is, again, a year ago. So languishing is not not depression. Uh, it's not quite burnout. It is a uh, kind of a combination of a case of the blahs where you don't have as much energy and motivation as usual, and maybe not quite as much optimism as usual. And yet you're also kind of restless at the same time. So it's an interesting blend of kind of the blahs and restlessness. And it's really, really common. I give a lot of workshops, as Dr. Gold knows, uh, here on our campus and in the community. And I talk a lot about languishing. And I see a lot of people's heads nod. Head, heads nod that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not depressed, I'm not down in the dumps, but I just don't have quite the spark that I used to have. It's real common. I think that's one of those consequences of having too much cortisol floating around for this, this period of time. Uh, <laughs> at least you're giving it, a, you know, you're giving us a representation of what's happening. And it's funny because we're living in it. So it's hard for us to really tell what's happening in our bodies. It does make me wonder, though, what happens to our bodies when we feel stress physically for this long? Is this actually kind of changing the way that we think now that this has been going on for so long? It, it, it probably, I mean, it is certainly in the short run. What are the long-term consequences? We don't know. I think we'll, we will heal from this, but it will take some time. So even if we could, you know, kind of wave a magic wand and make this virus disappear off the face of the earth today, we would still need some time to heal, you know, our, our psyches as well as our bodies. Um, we're adaptable. We're a very adaptable species, you know, so we will get through this, but it's going to take take some time. What does that chronic stress do? Well, you know, that cortisol, one of the consequences of too much cortisol is it shrinks temporarily, shrinks our uh, hippocampi, and the hippocampi are the short-term memory parts of the brain. So a lot of people are reporting they feel a little more forgetful than usual. Uh, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, as you mentioned earlier, and so, you know, I see patients over 65, some of whom actually have things like dementia. But I think a lot of my older patients feel like they have dementia when they don't, you know, because of the stress. Um, again, that's a that's a fixable problem and a, and a treatable or a, a something that will correct itself when the stress uh, go, you know, abates. But in the short run, it's it does cause that. That's one of the common side effects that we see. You know, for those of us who aren't able to readily go out and take a walk or do some of these other activities that can help us de-stress, um, you say that breathing for a few seconds at a time can help you feel better. Can you show us what you mean by that? Yeah, it, it turns out when the scientists have studied um, things like meditation and mindfulness and yoga and some of these other time-tested um, uh, avenues to, to peace, one of the common elements is most of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them um, promote slow, deliberate breathing. Normally, you don't think about your breathing, right? You just sort of do it. But if you deliberately slow your breathing down, even for a minute or so, it tends to uh, reduce your stress. So what I recommend to people is they practice breathing in really slowly. And by doing that, the way to do it is uh, count to six just inside your head. Count to six as you inhale. Hold it for maybe a second or two, and then count to six as you exhale. And you do that three or four breaths in a row, and it can have a remarkable calming effect. Only takes about a minute or so. I call that a micro practice. I didn't come up with that word, incidentally. Some radiologists wrote a paper on this a year or two ago, and they said, what, you know, what can busy physicians do in the middle of a day where, when it's really hectic? Well, Take two or three or four of those six second in, six second out breaths, and it really works. I did a couple of those before this this uh, airing, incidentally, to kind of manage my stress. Mm -hmm. It really works. You know, Dr. Gold, working as a surgeon, especially on tiny baby hearts, is that something that you do as a, as a technique to de-stress, breathing exercises? 
Well, I only wish I had learned that many years ago, but uh, ever since I've been working with Dr. Wengel and others, uh, I have found that at certain times of the day, it's a very helpful thing to do. Sometimes, you know, at night, before I sit down for a meal or uh, early in the morning, uh, I have found it to be uh, really good advice. You know, there are a lot of people who have learned how to meditate, and there are all types of mindfulness techniques that people have talked about. And, uh, you know, at the right time and the right place, uh, uh, they're probably very useful. And, and we spend a lot of time, and I know Dr. Wengel does, you know, we, one of the biggest challenges that, in terms of stress that we've seen uh, is in those individuals that had to come to work. So and particularly for us, it's the frontline healthcare workers, the physicians, pharmacists, nurses, therapists, dietitians, and others, where people's lives depend on their coming to work day in and day out. And Dr. Wengel has just done an amazing job of helping to manage the wellness of our population. Not to say that we haven't seen a good deal of burnout, but I think we are ahead of the game compared to many other institutions. And that's because of all the techniques that Dr. Wengel uh, has been talking about. And also the destigmatization, the ability to talk about it and ask people how they're feeling. Are you feeling burnt out? Are you feeling, you know, depressed or tired or stressed? And if so, let's talk about it. Or maybe you want to talk about it with a family member, a clergyman, or somebody uh, from the healthcare community. Those are all techniques that really reduce the impact of the stress that this pandemic has caused. Absolutely. Great advice from both of you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and join our conversation. We're going to pause for a quick break. Brenda has been hanging on the line. We're going to get to your call right after this quick break. We thank you for your patience and we still have time for your phone call as well. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Joining us once again is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight, we welcome Dr. Stephen Wangle, psychiatry professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we promised Brenda that we would take her call right after the break. We are going to live up to that promise. Thanks for joining us, Brenda. Go right ahead. Yes, I'd like to know, since Delta and the Omicron are airborne, how safe is it to go to the dentist? For instance, if you're going in for a teeth cleaning, you're sitting in the room for an hour without a mask on, breathing, and then I'm the next patient who comes in, goes into the room, and I'm breathing in all that air. So is it something that should be maybe postponed? Uh, just like to know, how, how safe is it to go to the dentist's office? So, Brenda, quite a few Americans uh, and people around the world have found a lot of different reasons over the years not to see their dentists, and uh, the presence of the COVID pandemic has certainly been one of them. However, most of the dentists that I know, certainly we uh, are honored and privileged to run some very large dental clinics as part of our dental school and, and practice areas as well, have done a lot of work on changing the air handling in the uh, what are called the operatories, the uh, rooms that the dentists work in. And they have also done an extensive amount of work in terms of special masks. Almost all of them use uh, N95 and KN95 masks, special uh, goggles and other protective equipment to protect them and to protect our patients, as have their uh, hygienists and their dental technicians, uh, et cetera. You know, the way uh, I would recommend doing it is, uh, you know, we're at a stage now where we're seeing community spread rates uh, start to fall. Uh, you know, depending on where in Nevada you're calling from, uh, you could look up to the uh, local public health district and see what the spread rates are. If they're reasonably low, uh, that would be a good time to give your dentist's office a call and ask them if they feel comfortable doing routine dental care or whether you should wait another two, four, or six weeks uh, till hopefully the community spread rates will fall uh, even lower. You know, as we talked about a little earlier in the show, I do think we're starting to see the Omicron spike get behind us. Now, there are a lot of ifs that will go forward uh, in terms of other subtypes and things of that nature. But if it continues to fall at the rate it's been falling, another two to four weeks will make a huge amount of difference. So if you've been really putting this off, 
I would say give it another couple of weeks in your community. If your community is already down to pre-Delta baseline, that is to say the case transmission rate, not the hospitalization or death rate, but the case transmission rate, and of course assuming that you are fully vaxxed and boosted, and of course assuming that your dentist and your dentist staff are fully vaxxed and boosted, uh, I would say it's reasonably safe to go ahead and get your teeth cleaned. All right. Thank you so much for that call. Brenda, Bill of Pennsylvania joins us now. Go right ahead, Bill. Um, hello there, Dr. Gold. I uh, appreciate evening. you taking my call tonight. And uh, I've learned a lot from you, so happy Valentine's Day to all of you out there. And uh, my you. question is this. My wife and I live in a retirement community here in Pennsylvania, close to Gettysburg. And uh, we... Uh, uh, have 89% participation in in our clinics that we held here in this continuing care home, which is pretty good for like 1,200 people that live here. And uh, uh, my wife and I are going to be 80 years old this year. We've been both vaccinated, married 60 years. So I couldn't have done any better. <laughs> and uh, we're both boosted. My, my question would be this. Uh, you hear so many different... Uh, 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 in inputs about what kind of masks to wear, uh, cloth masks, the surgical masks, or the N95s. And my question would be this, uh, what, what do you suggest that we wear to be safe? Because I wear them when I go to the grocery store. I wear them when I go to pick up my mail. I wear them. I'm very religious about this. Like I said, I lost some family members, and family members uh, in my family were very conservative here in Pennsylvania. They don't get the shots. And I have a brother-in-law right now and a niece that's uh, sick with the COVID. Thank you for your help. Well, thank you for your kind words, Bill, and uh, appreciate uh, your watching the show. Uh, <clears throat> so in terms of two, two comments uh, unrelated, one about masks. The N95s and KN95s are still the best because they have both a filtration effect and they also have an uh, electronic charge built into the material so that they actually trap the aerosolized particles. Uh, and so they are the most form-fitting, and indeed they are the most efficient at protecting you and protecting others. That's followed by the procedural masks, which is least effective would be the cloth masks, at least the single-layer uh, cloth masks. The only other comment I might make for your, you and your wife, Bill, depending upon when you got your booster, you may be noticing that other parts of the world are now recommending a second booster for people that are over 65 years of age. We have not quite gotten to that place in the United States just yet with a wide recommendation, but we will be considering that. That's we, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Advisory Committee uh, in the not-so-distant future. Having said that, uh, I know of quite a few people who are in your age group who are really waiting uh, for advice from their local health care professional as to what they should uh, be doing. So I think it's probably a good idea to keep wearing your mask, to get your mail, to pick up your groceries and things of that nature, certainly if you're going out. Uh, at all for any errands, uh, but also it may be worth a call to your local health care professional to get her or his advice as to when you might be eligible for yet another boost and whether you should wait for one of these new Omicron-specific boosts to come out, which will hopefully be sometime in April, or whether this would be the time uh, to consider it. But it does sound like you and your wife are taking extra good care of yourself, uh, which is the way we're going to get through this. Yeah. Congratulations. 60 years on this Valentine's Day. Congratulations, Bill. Mm. Thanks for that call. Dr. Wengel, let's bring you back into the conversation for a moment because the social isolation that many of us have been dealing with, in some cases, it's led to depression, loneliness, and there are some examples of things that we use to de-stress which are not recommended, that don't even work necessarily. Let's go down that road for a moment, because a lot of people have been making poor choices under the pressure of the pandemic. What should we be avoiding right now? 
Right. You know, we we do what we need to do to get through difficult times. And some of those things are good and some of those things are maybe not as healthy. So some of the things we don't recommend, one thing uh, right off the top of my head is uh, denial. Sometimes we just sort of don't acknowledge the fact that we're languishing, for example, or we're, you know, worried about the pandemic or whatever. Now, on one hand, you don't want to dwell on it. But on the other hand, completely denying it probably doesn't work in the long term. The other thing, though, is that we've seen um, increased rates of substance use disorders, you know, alcohol, uh, drugs of abuse, certainly the opioids, you know, which, of course, we've known as uh, the opioid crisis has been going on for a long time anyway. But that that is exacerbated during the pandemic because people are doing what they feel like they need to do just to sort of get through it. So that's one thing I really tell people to do is really be careful and really if you notice or other people around you notice that you're drinking more than usual and people are concerned or you're concerned or, uh, you know, again, avoiding drug, drugs of abuse and all that sort of thing. One other thing, one related thing that sometimes catches people off guard that we do that's not really a drug, but it kind of can be addictive too, and that's too much social media or too much internet surfing you know, instead of sleeping or instead of doing other healthy things like exercise. I think we've all been guilty of that. I know I have at times. So there, you know, so that's one thing I tell people to kind of keep an eye on because that sneaks up on you too. Yeah, so does the weight as well. When you stay inside, if you're watching TV, eating the potato chips, I think that's something many of us have been struggling with as well, at least at this point of the pandemic. You know, we want to go back to the phones. We don't have a lot of time, but Sharon, I want to get your call in. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Good evening, Dr. Gold, and uh, my husband and I watch your, t- your show all the time. We have, I have a, two questions for you. The first question, you had talked about the antibody test, and somebody wanted to get it done, that there was two different tests to have drawn to determine the antigen itself the, 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 from the shot, and if you have had COVID, what, uh, that, that test, there was another test there. Uh, and I'd like for you to uh, go over that again. And then... Another question I have, is there such a thing as a delayed reaction to the second shot, to the COVID uh, uh, Pfizer shot? Can you have a delayed reaction to the second shot to where you get sick from it? Um, I had a daughter that had um, uh, about nine days after she got her second shot, she got very sick. And she went and got tested. She came up negative for influenza A, influenza B, and COVID. And that's why I was wanting to know if there was a, a possibility that she could have had a reaction to that second shot. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for your two questions. I'll try to answer them uh, quickly because I know we're a little bit running short of time. In terms of the antibody tests, uh, yes, uh, yes, you're exactly right. There are two. Uh, there is one that looks at what's called the spike protein. That's the area that is used in the vaccines to create an immune reaction. And the second is what's called the nucleocapsid uh, antibodies. Those are positive in individuals that have been infected with COVID. And so if you've been vaccinated and not infected, you'll be spike antibody positive and nucleocapsid negative. If you've been infected, uh, whether or not you've been vaccinated or not, you'll be positive for both. And so that's how one tells the difference. And as far as delayed uh, vaccine reactions are concerned, uh, I'm sure that there's a variability, but to be have minimal or no reaction, and then to have a delayed reaction eight or 10 or 15 days later, uh, to me, that would result in a call to my local healthcare professional, because that would be quite unusual. What we normally see is within 24 to 48 hours, we see some uh, loss of sleep, a little bit of headache, some lightheadedness, possibly some very low grade temperature. Uh, it could be nothing, but something along those areas and certainly some soreness of your arm. If it's more than that or if it lasts longer, that's a time to make a phone call to your healthcare professional. All right. We are so glad that we were able to get that call in tonight. Thank you so much for joining us at home, Dr. Stephen Wangel. Dr. Jeffrey Gold, thank you so much for being with us. Now, if we did not get to your question tonight, you can leave us a voice recording on our hotline. The number is 855-776-6147. And remember, you can catch Rural Health Matters every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 Central, right here on RFD TV. Get your questions ready for next week. We will be here for you probably the only television show where you can ask your questions about the virus live and get an answer just like that. 
from one of the world's leading medical experts. We'll see you next week. Hope you and those you love have a beautifully blessed Valentine's.